Hello everyone. Today, I'd like to talk about steel and why I think it is a great material for building a bicycle frame. So in this video, we're gonna get into the material properties of steel and how it is different from other materials used to build bicycle frames. Some of you may recall last year, I did a video series where I documented the process that I went through to have this custom steel bike built for me. During that series, I received a lot of questions asking about steel, the tubing selection that I use, and some other questions that uh, I thought were very interesting and insightful. So today, what I'd like to do is go back to that discussion and dig in a little bit deeper about steel. <clears throat> okay, so what is steel? Steel is an alloy of iron and carbon with a mixture of other trace elements such as nickel, magnesium, chromoly, uh, chrome moly benedum, I think is how it's pronounced, and perhaps some other trace elements which gives steel different unique properties depending on what it is used for. Now the element that makes steel strong is carbon, but too much carbon and the steel becomes very brittle, too little carbon and the steel is not strong enough. So there's a perfect balance between the optimum amount of carbon to give steel the ideal amount of strength but also retain much of its ductility. So steel is probably one of the most widely used materials in, the, in our society today. It's used for building bridges, it's used to reinforce concrete structures, it's used to build automobiles and trains, and it's even used to build bicycles. You, the reason steel is such a, a widely used material is because it is fairly easy to produce, uh, manufacture I should say, and it has the ability to be welded, it has a high fatigue resistance, it is corrosion resistance if, it's added, if the certain elements we talked about earlier are added such as nickel then it becomes very corrosion resistant and steel also has a specific property which makes it very unique in that it has a very high ductility. So what is ductility? Let's find out. Okay, so I have a few diagrams here on this whiteboard to help us understand the differences between the different materials. Now don't freak out. I'm gonna go through this. I think it'll be pretty easy to understand once I go through it all. Um, and I think it'll help really clarify what we're trying to what we're trying to talk about when we talk about steel or carbon. So let's take a little bit closer look here of these diagrams. So uh, up at the top, I have a an X Y plot, and this is what is known as a stress strain diagram. So engineers create a stress strain diagram for all the materials that they use when they are designing an object or a structure that's going to carry some sort of a load or it's going to be used in some sort of a structural application. Over here I have a sample bar of steel. It has a cross section that is one inch by one inch. It has an initial length L and it has a change in length of delta L because it has forces applied to it at both ends. So let's say I had a, a rubber band here. It has an initial length right now, and then when I pull on it, it stretches. So that's what this represents here. Over here I have the definition of the terms for stress and strain. Now you may have heard of these terms before because you, when you go to work, you're often stressed and or you are strained, but most likely you are both. So what is stress? So stress, in an engineering sense, is simply the amount of force that's applied to an object divided by its cross-sectional area. Now this is a very simplified, probably oversimplified explanation, but just hear me out on this and hopefully it'll make sense in a little bit. Strain, on the other hand, 
is simply a unitless term that is defined as the change in the length divided by the initial length. So it's basically a percentage of the elongation um, and it's often reported as a percentage or it can be, be used in a, as a decimal when you do a calculation. So over here on our diagram, I have stress on the y-axis and I have strain on the x-axis and I have a couple of different curves in different colors. So up here in blue, we have steel. Blue is gonna represent steel. Green is gonna represent titanium. Red is going to represent aluminum. And black is going to represent carbon fiber. Over here, I've drawn out the uh, approximate uh, moduluses, the Young's modulus for these different materials. So for steel, the Young's modulus is 29,000. Uh, carbon is 8,000 and aluminum is 16,000. I didn't write out titanium because I didn't look it up, unfortunately, but I know that it is a little bit higher than aluminum, but a little lower than steel. So what is Young's modulus? So let me just quickly explain what Young's modulus is. So anytime a material is loaded with some sort of load, it will stretch. And for most materials will stretch at least a little bit before they break. And a lot of materials will stretch and go back to their original shape. So they will not be what is said to be permanently deformed. They will not be permanently deformed. So when you look at the stress strain diagram, when there is a linear relationship where you have more or less a straight line, that is what's called the linear elastic state. So any material within its linear elastic state can be defined as a line with a slope. The slope of the line, which is the rise divided by the run, is what is known as Young's modulus. So it's very simply just the slope of the line when it is in a linear elastic state. Once it goes non-linear, once a material reaches its what's called the yield point, it goes into a non, some sort of non-linear behavior and Young's modulus no longer matters anymore because now it is, the object is either bending or it is breaking. So with steel, and this is how we get back to the earlier discussion of why steel is such a unique material, is that steel, when it yields, it yields for a very long time before it goes into the next phase right here where it actually starts to get stronger again. So it yields, which means it just deforms without, it deforms a lot without any initial, it deforms a lot without any uh, additional load. So, it, so it's linear elastic, linear elastic, it starts to yield and no additional load, it just stretches a lot and then it starts to get stronger again and it's said to start to strain harden and then eventually it ruptures and it breaks. Now compare that to these other materials and you don't see this horizontal line, uh, this horizontal yield plateau that you would see with steel. So down here with titanium, it's linear elastic and then it goes non-linear and it breaks. Aluminum is very similar to that type of behavior. It is linear elastic, then it goes non-linear and then it breaks. But then let's look at carbon fiber. That one's very unique. This one is linear elastic all the way up until it fails. So it does not yield. That's one of the differences between carbon and steel is that carbon does not yield. It just suddenly breaks. Now, I didn't give carbon a fair um, ratio here, if you will, on this chart. Carbon is a very strong material. It has a, it has a very high strength. So it could actually break, it could actually stretch all the way beyond the strength of steel. Oops. It could actually go more like this. It could actually surpass steel before it breaks. Um, which is why for most bicycle designs, it doesn't become a problem that it doesn't have a yield plateau because it is so strong that generally a bicycle designer can design within those parameters and make sure that the bike is not so weak that it'll just break suddenly. Um, but if it does break, it's gonna break without warning. So steel 
will give you a warning, a, a very, very large warning before it breaks. Whereas titanium and aluminum will not either, but um, they do start to bend significantly before they break. So you'll see some bending and then break, then rupture. Okay. Okay, well that's all I wanted to talk about in this video today. Please check back. In the next video, we're gonna get into section properties. We're gonna talk about tubing size and wall thickness. And we're gonna talk about how that size of tubing with this information will determine how flexible or how stiff a bicycle frame might be. And it will all, we'll also talk about how it will affect how strong a bicycle frame is as well. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this first video and uh, please check back so we can carry on this conversation and then I'll see you next time.